Right. <clears throat> well, I can only find uh, one microphone at the moment, so I'm afraid this is going to uh, have to be in uh, sort of half-track mono. <clears throat> Sorry about that. It's a bit bad, actually, for someone who uh, produces records for a living. But I hope uh, you'll be able to be able to hear this all right. It should sound all right if you play it back on a mono machine. Right, what was I doing before working with Hawkwind and Friends? I was uh, living in uh, Ramsgate and Broadstairs in Kent by the sea, uh, having decided to move from Margate, which is just down the road. And I uh, spent a lot of time in the winter out of work, as most of the lads did in that place, and we didn't actually think that was much of a of a hardship in those days. It seemed to be, uh, you know, I mean, being offered a job was probably the uh, ultimate doom that uh, we were all trying to avoid. <coughs> and of course, we worked in the summer. Uh, I worked in Dreamland, the amusement park in Margate. Did a bit of work on deck chairs, a bit of beach photography and that sort of thing. Uh, Nick Turner was selling funny hats at the time on the front and in the summer it was quite actually quite possible if you used your wits to uh, to make enough money <coughs> to keep you going with your doll money through the winter and that was the time when uh, you know you had plenty of time to sort of dream up ideas and things and uh, Nick and uh, Dick Nick and myself used to knock about together and uh, talk about the sort of band we would get together if we uh, had half a chance. We used to come up to London quite a lot to see bands playing and that's where I first met Dave Brock when he was busking in Portobello Road. We used to go up and used to see him uh, a few weekends, quite a few weekends during the winter and the summer in fact, if we weren't working on the uh, weekend. <coughs> So that's the sort of thing I did. Uh, I did actually quite a long stretch of teaching English to foreign students in the local uh, foreign students academy. And uh, that was actually quite enjoyable. And that was quite an enjoyable way to spend the summer because it left a lot of free time. The money was quite good because you could do private lessons for what in those days was a lot of money for about two quid an hour or something like that. Um, and I did a lot of writing in my spare time, and uh, I used to, when I came up to London, to trip down to the friend's office to contribute a few bits and pieces of writing I'd done, until uh, I suppose I gradually found myself spending more time in London, less time going back on the train, it seemed to be less to go back for, and more happening, there was a lot happening around the uh, Notting Hill area at that time. And I suppose I got actively involved with music through just uh, spending a lot of time. I used to re review certain gigs. I went out to review gigs, hang around gigs. I did poetry. I'd done readings. I'd, I mean, I've always, I'd always written poetry since I was about 15. And I'd done sort of the odd reading in first of all in folk clubs actually really a long time before this and then I started doing some readings around rock gigs I mean particularly around the gigs that were being put on at the Seven Sisters Club the Sisters Club it was called which was sort of jointly organized by IT and friends and that was the first gig with Hawkwind I actually played I uh, got involved. I mean, I'd, I mean, I'd seen Nick. No, actually, yeah, that was the very first gig with Hawkins at the Sisters Club, yeah. Got up on the stage with the band at their invitation and read a long poem to start the set of the show off with that was called Co-Pilots of Spaceship Earth and it was sort of um, something I've been working on for quite a long time and that was really the beginning of the space ritual. That was the sort of germ of the space ritual. Um, 
it wasn't through friends that I first met Hawkwind, in fact. It was uh, really through the fact that Nick was an old mate from, from, from Kent and Dick Mick. And uh, when they went off to join Hawkwind, I actually went off to form another I started to form another sort of band which was quite a lunas, lunas quite a lot of lunacy was involved in it it was um, it was me and three French musicians two guitarists and a percussionist who didn't speak very much English I didn't speak any French and we did a few gigs the very the, the first gig I did with them was actually at the roundhouse I think it was the night after Hawkwind played there and I met Turner the next day and we were sort of discussing what we were up to because I hadn't actually, to be quite honest, I hadn't really taken that much notice of what Hawkwind was doing up until that point. And well, they hadn't been formed very long, but I just, I just thought that it was some sort of good time rock and roll band. I didn't like that. I must say, I didn't like the name. I, did, I thought Hawkwind sounded like a silly name. Um, it wasn't until uh, in until we were standing in the uh, restaurant coffee bar of the roundhouse that Nick said when I asked him what sort of music Hawkwind was playing he, he said space rock which se which is a term I hadn't actually heard before but it, it seemed sort of like the magic key to a movement uh, that was about that was afoot at the time that I felt myself to be part of it was, it was sort of like Ezra Pound and uh, you know the imagist sort of discussing a new movement in poetry. I mean, it, to me, it sounded like uh, something brand new, which it was. And it wasn't long after that I found myself performing more gigs after the Sisters gig, more gigs with the band, and I'd already planned the idea of doing the Space Ritual, not necessarily with Hawkwind. I, it was something I'd wanted to do, to get some musicians together to, to help me do for quite a long time. I think even probably before even Hawkwind was formed, it was something that I used to um, sort of dream up and write bits of while I was uh, working in my mum's shop, actually, on the odd few hours when she had to pop out. I used to take over her news agent tobacconist shop. And uh, that was actually where I heard the news that Jimi Hendrix died, as it happens. So that fixes it in time, I suppose. Uh, but I won't go into all that. <coughs> As to when I actually joined the band, it's very hard to say. And I'm, I'm not very good at... Uh, I don't keep a diary, and I don't really sort of attach a lot of significance to uh, to dates. I never have done. I was... Uh, I've always attached more significance to to place, actually, rather than time. To space, I suppose you could say, rather than to time. Um, no, I think I think where things happen is and how things happen is far more important than exactly when they happen, which is just sort of arbitrary measurement. Um, and you can't. I mean, you, it's something you can't. Time is something you can't visualize either, unless you unless you visualize it in numbers. And I don't think in in numerical terms or abstract terms at all. Really, I can only really think in concrete images. And time doesn't give you any sort of concrete image, unless you think of a clock face, which of course is nothing to do with time. The uh, success of Silver Machine obviously meant quite a difference in the, to the band's capacity to earn money, which meant rather more to our record company than I think it did to us at the time. It happened, at least. I mean, it was something that... Uh, I mean, it was, we, were, we were actually asked if we would mind if they put Silver Machine out as a single. It was just, it was just part, one of the songs in the Space Ritual. And... When I, I'd never thought of it as I said, I'd never thought of making it singles at all. I thought singles were really something that was, you know, was another sort of industry altogether from the one that we were in. And when it was suggested and everybody agreed that it was a good idea to do it, I didn't. I was so naive in those days that I couldn't really see any way 
that if you made a single, it, it wasn't a hit. You know, I thought, you know, I assumed that, you know, if you if you got into the uh, process of making singles, then you were in the business of making hit singles, and that was it. You know, a single was a hit single. So it didn't surprise me that it uh, got to the top of the charts at all. Um, I think I would have been very surprised if it hadn't, in fact. Not because I thought it was fantastic or anything like that, because, or, or any better than any other single. It was just purely and simply because I thought that's what singles did. I uh, subsequently found out that's not what singles do, most of them. But um, that was how naive I was then. Um, I can't remember why I wasn't involved in the recording of the Do Re Mi album because I think a couple of my songs are on it. Uh, it may just have well have been that at that time I think I was I was purely sort of as it were a resident poet in the band, and we hadn't at that time got into any thoughts of recording poetry. And music. I mean, it was something that uh, that actually did go down very well with live audiences. Um, it all seemed to be. I mean, I don't think there was any other band, at least not in England, that was doing anything quite like this. I mean, to sort of you know playing long stretches of free form experimental electronic music with spoken poetry being read to it in the in the way that earlier poets read their work to jazz but it seemed at the time we were doing it to be a sort of an inevitable extension of the whole experimental feeling there was in sort of in the days of the underground if you like um, and I think we were saving that we were saving the recording of that for uh, for the space ritual which is to be the follow-up album in fact, the Do Re Mi album seemed to, as far as I remember, seems to have sort of sprung on me. I wasn't expecting it to be, to be recorded. I think it was pressure of the record company. They needed an album quickly, and they got, and, and it was done very quickly, actually. Um, my involvement was still quite loose with the band in those days. I mean, I wasn't a musician by any means at all. Uh, so I wasn't really considered to be a sort of one of the sort of elite members of the group, in that I didn't play anything, I didn't sing, and contribute anything that could be commercial. And it wasn't until, um, I mean, cause, you know, obviously poetry and music wasn't seen as, as at all commercial by, by the record company, but it wasn't until the astonishing success of the Space Ritual, which I think must be, must have been, in any terms, the very most successful combination of poetry and music that's ever been sold on a record. Um, in fact, it is. It's still in the history of the band. The Space Ritual is the is the is the biggest selling album the band's produced so far. And uh, that's something to think about uh, that uh, po that poetry and music can can actually sort of. I think, believe it. It was it, it was a double album, and it and it was in the charts. I think at number nine for for weeks on end. I st I'm not really sure if any of this is coming. The needles flickering away over there on the right hand channel. I hope it's all recording all right. Um. My reasons behind the writing of Captain Lockheed are really quite hard to remember now because it was something that, again, that I planned quite a number of years before I actually did it. it was something I really wanted to do. It was, I mean, I'd always been interested in aeroplane technology, aerospace technology. And uh, the Starfighter tragedy or whatever you want to call it the starfighter program phenomena was always something that fascinated me i was i mean this sort of you know 
gigantic arms dealing monolithic indus industry causing all that chaos and I mean it was something that I couldn't really come to grips with in any other way so I had to write something about it I mean I had thought and I still do have in my mind I'd like to, I'd like to do a, a, a novel about uh, that era and the German Air Force at that time and not very much actually has been written about the Starfighter thing at all I, I, this is something that when I, when I tried to get hold of research material to, to, to work on the album I found it very difficult to find anything that had been written about it. I had to look for bits and pieces and mentions and footnotes in uh, in work, you know, in books on uh, on the history of aviation. I mean, it was it, no no one book has been devoted to the subject. I noticed also that subsequent to the album, there's been a sort of an expose of Lockheed's. Work in, in uh, not in Germany as yet, but in Holland particularly. Um, there was a scandal involving uh, the government and Lockheed at that time. But I mean, th that sort of thing obviously goes on in uh, arms sales. I mean, arms dealing is probably the, the very epitome of. Uh, modern commercial practice, I would say, worse than the oil business. There's another subject too too wide and deep to go into this in this uh, interview. Um the reason I had so many Hawkwin members guesting on the album since you ask is Simply because they were there, I suppose. I mean, they're the only musicians that I knew. Um, and they certainly, I mean, I mean, the music was, you know, Hawkwind style music was very appropriate. I would like to have had more of Dave on the album, actually, but he was in Devon and found it, you know, that, you know, in his time off that he, he wanted to be at home with his family. And, uh, so I just, you know, made what, what I could with, um, those members of the band that were in London and were available at the time. And it, I mean, it was one of those things in those days. I mean, this is the way albums were made. I mean, uh, money was never a consideration. At least not for us at that time. You, know, you booked a studio and you rang people up and asked them if they would like to come down and record. And if they were available, they did. And if they weren't, you got someone else. And it was all very loose and lots of money was wasted in the studio in this way of working, um, which um, is a way you don't, you know, one doesn't work today in these, uh, in these much harsher times. It's much more economic. Consider much more economic considerations come into it. Urban Gorilla wasn't written about anyone in particular, but it was another case of uh, something that was written a long time before it actually saw the light of day in the form of uh, recording. It actually came from um, just bowling down uh, one of these side streets in Notting Hill, I noticed the the term urban gorilla had been sprayed up on a wall, or actually on a corrugated iron piece of sheeting that was tacked up to cover some, some uh, blemish in the local architecture. And in this sort of great black dribbling spray paint was this term, urban gorilla, which uh, obviously somebody had sprayed there simply because the term it held a lot of heroic and exciting ideal sort of 
mythological, modern, you know, kind of feeling for whoever wrote it. Uh, it was a term that I had heard mentioned, but I'd never really thought about until I saw it proclaimed in this way. And uh, it wasn't that long after that that I found a paperback book that was a sort of a study of uh, of guerrilla tactics that was called Urban Guerrilla, and it the cover of the book actually featured a corrugated iron wall with the word Urban Guerrilla sprayed on it, and the two thing when I saw that the two things sort of you know my 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 feelings about the whole thing I read the book which was actually written by uh, a soldier called Calvert as it so happens he was um, I think he's a, a military advisor in the British Army a Colonel Calvert or somebody or other Calvert who. Uh, Anyway, that's just one of those small coincidences that um, really don't mean a lot to anyone, unless you you know, depend. Well, they obviously may have meant something to me from my point of view, but it wouldn't to anyone else. But there you are, the subject subjectivity of coincidence, which is another subject. But. Uh, I wrote it, I really wrote it because I, you know, I, I wanted to express that sort of feeling that, you know, that I'd seen expressed in the spray paint and also my own feelings about it. And I'm alarmed to see now that, uh, well, I was alarmed actually shortly after that to see how much, uh, or how many other people had obviously thought that it was that an urban gorilla was something to be. I mean, I mean, it's not something that I feel that I would like to be myself at all, other than in the realms of fantasy. But uh, you know, in a manner of speaking, it's something which has heavily caught on since those days. I mean, I mean, when I saw that written, it, it wasn't something that existed in this country at least um it was it was a sort of remote thing to do with uh mediterranean countries and uh mexican revolutions really it didn't surprise me that it was banned by the bbc at all in fact, I expected it to cause a lot of controversy. It, it, it made the front pages of the newspapers. I in particular remember that headline in the, on the front page of the Evening Standard when it was uh, withdrawn from the market. I'm just going to check with the phone. Oh, it's not too bad on this machine. I don't know what it's like on yours, but uh, it's audible anyway. So, um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't written to deliberately cause controversy, but I knew it would. and. I didn't expect to be, t I mean, I was really heavily taken to task a lot. I had to give interviews, um, which were quite embarrassing, really, because it, you know, the statements I've made in the song, which obviously <coughs> weren't uh, a refutation of guerrilla tactics by any means at all. But I really, you know, what I meant, by the lyric was, you know, I, I meant it as a as a metaphor for an attitude, rather than uh, an incitement for young people to go out and get themselves guns. Um, I suppose it it got me uh, a file opened by the special branch or at least by the Home Office and some department by the Home Office, I think uh, Nick Turner actually has got one on him, for sure. I mean, he has uh, had his premises raided in, in, a, in, a, in an arms bomb search. That was a few years ago now, but 
you know, I, I think you can't uh, get away with um, something like that. I mean, it, it, the fact is the record is now a collector. I mean, quite a few, because of the success of Silver Machine, obviously, I mean, thousands of things were printed, or, you know, pressed. And you can still buy them now. And second-hand copies changing hands at quite a high rate. Quite, you know, quite a lot of money. Captain Lockheed was quite a successful album. I mean, are you asking, was it successful in commercial terms? I think you might be. Uh, well, let's take that first. I mean, it, yes, it sold. It sold well, and it still does. I mean, it's still selling in America and as an import, not in alarmingly large quantities. But I mean, for an album that old, was it seventy-three, which makes it eight years, getting on for nine years old. I think that's quite a long sales life, really. Um, whether it was successful in artistic terms is something that I'm really not the person to ask because I never think anything I do is successful in those terms. I mean, I've always listened to things I've done or read things I've written or had published and wish that I could uh, get them back again and work on them more. I still work on stuff that's already published. I mean, I've got revisions of songs that have already been recorded and sold and gone now. And I still, sort of, from time to time, revise away at them. I'm a great reviser. But Lockheed was recorded, as I said before, in that sort of spirit, in that loose, spontaneous spirit, which I think it needed to have. And I think some of it's more, some of the album, there's a lot on the album, actually. I mean, there's, there's a lot of tracks on it, and some of them are obviously more successful than others. It's a pity that I didn't really have the... Uh, maturity of approach that I've sort of grown up with now to have spent more time actually planning it in advance and it was quite heavily planned but not as much as I would do now but you know planned carefully and worked over more rather than arrived at by extemporaneous means Uh, you say that some of my vocals on the album sound very like Peter Hamill, which is something no one's actually said to me before. And I find that a, a rather flattering remark. I think. I mean, I think. I think Peter Hamill is probably one of the one of the finest vocalists, vocal stylists, as they call them in America, that we've got in England that well, we've had, but in rock, anyway. And uh, if I sound anything at all like him, or if I did in those days, I mean, that was not a, a conscious effort at all. I mean, I, had, I was aware of him. I didn't really appreciate him as much as I do now. Uh, but I was, and I'd heard, you know, I'd heard uh, the Van de Graaff albums. But I didn't set out to imitate his voice in any way at all um, I worked in a way which was far less self-conscious than I do now which may have been in some ways better and in some ways not so good but I was certainly not uh, trying to sound like anyone but just to sort of sound I mean I was more, re more or less trying to sound appropriate for the songs I was doing, which is still something I try to do now, which I think is why my voice varies in style 
from uh, song to song. Well, at least it, to my ears it does. Maybe to, to someone else it doesn't. But I, um, you know, all I try to do is, is sort of is is to perform a song in a way that it, to to my way of thinking that it needs to be performed. The cancellation of the of the Lockheed tour um, probably affected me a lot more than I realised it had at the time. I mean, if a lot of people around me at the time, including Jamie Mendelkauer, who's a Canadian writer who lived in, who was quite a, a mate who lived in London at the time. He lives in Canada again now. But he said to me um, that it was the biggest tragedy that I uh, could have. Uh, had foisted on me. Um, it was all to do with purely banal personal reasons as well, actually, which to me was, um, it was all over a woman. I won't go into it. It, it was all over a girl, actually. Um, <sighs> Jamie said that uh, had I, if I'd done the tour, that it would have put me very firmly on the map as a sort of leading British solo recording artist sort of thing, which is which was nothing at all to do with what I was aiming at being anyway, so it didn't really worry me. Um, I, I did want to do the tour very much. I, I really wanted to stage a sort of major uh, theatrical event and take it around the country. Uh... You know, as a sort of completely further extension of the space rituals style of staging things. I mean, something I wanted to do something with actors and with proper drama in it. Um, and I would have uh, probably been breaking quite a lot of new ground if I'd done it then. I probably would be if I did it now, actually. Uh, I, I can't really see any sort of successful rock theatre projects has really been done. I mean, there are bands, I mean, like the Tubes, for example, who do, who use theatre with rock, but um, it's never really been integrated enough, in my opinion. So, uh, it probably affected the, uh, the people who made the money out of me at that time more than it affected me, personally. Uh, but they were the people who, 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 uh, whose idea it was to, to back out of the tour for the personal region, reasons that I touched on just a minute ago. And rather than resurrect any sort of personal wrangling, which, uh, you know, or any sort of hatchet that, that, that would be better left buried, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Um, yeah, between Captain Lockheed and Lucky Leaf, I recorded, I think I'm right, that I recorded a version of the Cricket Star song and a, uh, and a B-side for it as a single, which United Artists didn't release for some reason. Probably because they didn't like, they didn't think reggae was a commercial prospect. That's what that was right. I remember the managing director of uh, United Artists inviting me into his office and explaining to me that uh, reggae was a minority ethnic cult and had no chance of ever becoming a commercial success. And when I think about doing something more in the vein of, uh, rock and roll, which seemed to be uh, something they could sell. So it got shelved. Um, but it was, it actually it wasn't, uh, it was a, it, uh, reggae is something I've never really enjoyed. And I think the Cricket Star was, 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 a, was actually a way of sort of getting back at a mate of mine called Rodney Henson, who's still a very good mate of mine. He works on an oil rig at the moment. Um, for playing reggae records the whole time. I mean, he's, a, he's absolutely reggae mad. 
And when he's on leave, he spends most of his time knocking around in jump-up shacks around the gate. And, uh, which I wouldn't uh, give you tums for myself. I just find, I find reggae, uh, uh, you know, as a musical form, so limited that, um, it really is a case of if you've heard one, you've heard quite a few of them. <laughs> quite a considerable few. So, the, I mean, the, I mean, obviously, a cricket star was done in, in a sort of, uh, jocular, Spirit, I mean, or even satirical. And that version, which the masters of which have long since been lost, unfortunately, was, uh, a lot more authentically reggae than the, uh, than the, than the more sort of pop electronic version that came out on the flimsy disc. Uh, I, you asked me if I was ever involved with Bowie. Um, no, I, I've never met, I never met David Bowie at all, although I would like very much to, uh, to actually bump into him. Don't know what I'd say to him, actually, really. Uh, but he is, he is somebody I've admired for most of his career, I suppose. Except for the very early days. I was, uh, Mark Boland was someone I, I used to see quite a lot because we shared the same management company for a time. And it was just before his, uh, untimely death that, uh, we did discuss, uh, seriously get, getting involved, um, you know, as, as sort of, uh, co-workers on a project that we, started to map out that was going to uh uh be it was well at least Granada television were extremely excited about it. Uh, this was the time when he was recording his uh series of kids shows and we sort of discovered that we had a lot in common in our influences and so which which surprised me I must say because uh his work is extremely different from mine, but his influences seem to be very much the same. He was, at that time, he was very much, um, taken by Bertolt Brecht, who, you know, who is now, as we know, one of the, uh, one of the more fashionable figures that, uh, that you can mention if you're going to name, uh, your credentials as far as influences go, but, um, Bowman had actually read, read, uh, a considerable amount of Brecht's work, particularly his poetry, which is something we both <laughs> admired very much. I don't know how many people who, who these days are going around talking about Giving the old nod to Bertolt, as I heard someone on, someone say on the old grey whistle test the other night. Uh, I wonder how many of them actually read very much of Brecht's enormous output and taken it seriously into consideration. Uh, so that, um, may well have, uh, resulted in, in, uh, in an interesting bit of uh, collaboration if if we'd ever done it and I think we pr I'm sure we would have done I mean I was getting messages from our manager almost daily up until the point when Bowen uh, crashed his car funnily enough um, I had uh, a minor in comparison a minor car crash a week before Bowen crashed his which was bit at the time seemed uh, full of significance and dreadful sort of portentousness I um, 
overturned uh, 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 an MG thirteen hundred, I think it was one of those sort of things. It looks a bit like a mini, in fact. It sort of overturned it in in a Devon lane, narrowly missing a cattle truck, wrote the car off completely, and escaped with only very minor cuts. And uh, when I heard it, all, it was exactly seven days after that that, that uh, Boland drove into a tree, or it was driven into a tree. Funny enough, I had a girl with me in the car who was, well, I wouldn't say it was funny. I mean, she was actually had a gashed head, was quite seriously injured and shaken up and traumatically affected by it. It seemed to me strange that Bolin was being driven by a girl and I was driving myself with the girl next to me and I escaped without any injury and she was badly injured. It all seemed to be, um, you know, the sort of thing that sparks off fatalistic thoughts. But who knows? I mean, as I said before, I mean, coincidences of it is something extremely subjective, and it is how you read an event that determines how much significance it holds. And car crashes happen every day. Yeah, the style of the music changed drastically on astounding on the astounding album. Uh this wasn't a conscious change at all by the band. This was really a reflection of the changes that have been made in lineup in the band. And I mean there was never I mean I must say there was never a time when any sort of conscious planning was made to determine any uh, anything to do with uh, musical content. In Hawkwind, I hope it still is, always was, a yeah, much more spontaneous affair than that. Paul Rudolph and Alan Powell were blamed by me and Brock for funky trend but uh, where you, you say that you you, you, you feel that, uh, that the songs that we wrote had, had a funky edge to them uh, that was if they did have at all, it was purely and simply because of the, uh, the fact that Powell and Rudolph but who, who formed the rhythm section, or at least a large percentage of the rhythm, rhythm section of the group at the time. So uh, any sort of funky nest in the rhythm was obviously down to that. But funky music and reggae are, are, are two things which I've never been overly fond of, and I know Dave hasn't been either, which is one of the, one of the things that we had in common. Did I try to make my lyrics more socially aware than before? No, I've never tried to make anything more anything than it was before, except better. Um, I have the sort of mind that can only really work on things that it is, I mean I work in, a, in an obsessive way that I can only write about things that currently obsess my mind and if you see any social awareness in any of the songs? I can't really think of what uh, what you're particularly referring to, but whatever you see in them is just a reflection of the sort of a, things that I was being obsessed by at the time or obsessed with. Uh, 
Um, no, I've never, I didn't, re I'm sure that it's, you know, to ask me, did I regret sacking Turner, Powell and Rudolph? Um, well, I mean, I didn't personally sack them myself, but did I regret the sacking of them? I can't say that I did, actually. I mean, certainly not in the case of Powell and Rudolph, who uh, really weren't or shouldn't have been considered as members of the band in any case, they, who really were session musicians who'd come in to, to fill a, a gap that existed at the time. I mean, Nick is in a much better position now than he was at that time and would have been if he'd stayed in the band. He's now got his own band, which he should have done a long time ago, uh, the Inner City Unit, which is uh, currently on tour with Spirit and being seen by a lot more people than he has been recently. And... Uh, I have great hopes for what Nick's doing. I think um, he could well emerge as a, as, a, as a major sort of musical force like Lemmy has. So I'm sure that Nick doesn't regret it. And uh, as I have now sacked myself in the band, I mean, I'm not really in a position sort of to feel any sort of um, regret or nostalgia about anything. In my opinion, I think Hawkwind really, although there is a band going round with that name still, with Dave leading it, uh, you know, I personally think that Hawkwind sort of finished really at the uh, time of the Hawklaw's album. I think the Hawk, I regarded the Hawklaw's album as the last album. Um, there have been, I think there's two more albums since then, neither of which I've heard, and I've heard only heard reports about them, which haven't encouraged me to go out and listen to them. You know, I think it would be a far more dignified thing if the band really was regarded as, as something which um, had a magnificent sort of life and uh, terrific long run as a major band and is now sort of uh, <coughs> broken up and gone, its, and gone into separate units now. Dave Brock would be doing himself a favour if he formed a band of his own and called it something quite different from Hawkwind and used it to express his own musical direction rather than sort of half-heartedly trying to resurrect a dispersed spirit. <clears throat> How many of my lyrics were inspired by books which I have read? I suppose a few have, obviously. Um, Damnation Alley was one, which is the title of a book by Roger Zelazny. Um, and Steppenwolf is another that springs to mind. I mean, but as I said before, what I write about is what I'm currently obsessed with one that my notebooks are currently referring to and uh, dredging things up into. And this is going, you know, as I do, I read a lot of books. I mean, books are, uh, are some of the things which do obsess. I was obsessed for a while by the imagery of Damnation Alley and by Steppenwolf. But I, I think... Uh, most of my lyrics are, are, if you want to use the word inspired, are inspired by what is currently in front of my senses at the time, as William Burroughs once said. Uh, a 
quite a lot of them by books that haven't been written yet, if you like. Probably books that I will, if I live long enough, will write myself. Hawkwind was a considerable success in France, quite a success in Germany and Holland. In fact, and as far as I know, not at all to any great extent in the USA, apart from sort of major industrial towns such as Detroit, for some reason. Um, which can't be, ex well, I suppose it can be explained, but I, uh, I can't explain it myself. The effect on the band when Simon House left. I have to think about that for a minute. Well, I suppose, in my opinion, that really marked the, more or less, the actual end of the, of the band as a band. Um, Steve Swindles uh, came in to record the Hawk Lords album, and who uh, is an excellent musician, but uh, then again, not a lot to do with the uh, spirit of the band. <clears throat> I believe that more Hawk Lords albums were planned, but as far as I was concerned, it was a one-off venture. There wasn't really a theme at all around the around the album itself, but there was around the stage show that we were presenting at the time. And the album was really a collection of songs. Why did I write The Days of the Underground? because I felt it was necessary to redress the balance of opinion of the time, which was that nothing at all of any worth was created in the period referred to in the song, that psychedelic music had no influence and no value, <clears throat> which I considered to be uh, something that had to be stated, brought into focus, because it was quite untrue. <laughs> the people mentioned were Characters who were around at the time, who used to hang around uh, friends, office, and various other places, they weren't so sort of, they weren't major sort of artistic figures by any means at all. They were sort of sort of types of people who you know that you <coughs> see all around the whole time, who are sort of like companions. Um, that was uh, Smiley Michael, who was uh, whose name implies that he was, you know, he was actually a jovial sort of person and someone that we were always glad to see. He was heavily into the use of drugs, which resulted in his, in his, in his falling from a third story window clinging to a rusty drain pipe and uh, breaking his neck. John the Bog was uh, 
bloke who did quite a lot of driving for us, actually. Um, he was killed in a in a in a motorway accident, and uh, Jeff was a Welsh, big strapping Welsh geezer who came down to London, wrote a bit of poetry in that, and uh, was one of the sort of luminous personalities that you like to have around and just didn't stay around for long enough. And he drowned, he got, he was actually drowned in Margate on a uh, day trip, which uh, involved him diving into a uh, sort of one of those uh, offshore swimming pools with seawater in them under the influence of Mandrex. Actually, he was, didn't actually drown. That was uh, sort of a poetic telescoping of events. He, he, what he did do is he actually broke his neck on the dive and died as a result sometime after that. I think I've already said uh, how I feel about the Hawk Lords or Hawkwind. I mean, the Hawk Lords really was just another name for the band. And we used the name for the album as at the time. Um, Hawkwind was, uh, was a name against which a great many sort of monetary claims were being made. So it seemed to, uh, it seemed to be uh, the safest thing to do at the time was to dissolve the uh, the company and reform it under a different name. But that again was only a sign of the beginning of the end. And that wasn't really the reason. I mean, I had actually handed in my notice about. Oh, over a year before I actually left. So I think, you know, I mean, I worked out one of the longest notices of termination of employment that, uh, that I've heard of anyway. But that was purely in order to fulfill the end of the contract with Charisma, which would have resulted in uh, disaster for the rest of the band if I'd left before the, uh, the terms were up. Why do I include humour and sarcasm in my lyrics? <coughs> I suppose it's because it's in my nature. Um, irony, anyway. I suppose because... Um, Humour is just something that I enjoy a lot. Now, any memorable moments? Uh, I, well, actually, too numerous to mention. I mean, obviously, it was a period that, um, you know, that I'd always hold memorable moments in connection with. I think probably one the one that immediately springs to mind was the night that um, we were about to be stopped by the police and I was handed uh, a, a massive handful of drugs to swallow along with everyone else and um, I wasn't really uh, very into swallowing large amounts of drugs at all and uh, the result of that was that uh, Lemmy and myself on arriving back at our house in Finchley that we shared, that the band shared, decided that we'd go off and get some cigarettes before the effects of these drugs wore on. And uh, it turned out that he'd taken a huge amount of uh, downers and I'd taken a huge amount of uppers. 
and we were walking along the streets of Finchley trying to find a cigarette machine, both undergoing the uh, separate effects of the drugs we'd swallowed. Um, and the upshot of it was that I uh, ended up having to escort Lemmy back in a taxi in a rigid state of near rigor mortis while I was in a highly babbling state of uh, speeded stupidity. That's my wife. Yes, there were a lot of bad scenes in Hawkwind. Um, most of them seem to be quite funny now, looking back at them. I remember a time when a very white-faced Simon King leapt up from behind his drum kit during a rehearsal and threatened to Turk me, in his, was the expression he used, which um, I had to think about for a minute or two before I realised that it meant something aggressive and that he was not very pleased with... Uh, my behavior at the time. Um, there were a lot of bad scenes, actually, other than the odd sort of hilarious outburst of uh, manic displeasure. There was quite a lot of backbiting going on. Um, I remember times when uh, there was an awful lot of almost near plotting to bring down various key figures, myself included. Um, Dave always compared it to the sort of <clears throat> sort of skull dudgery that goes on in, in something like the Roman Senate. I mean, it was quite often like uh, a complex of cross plotting um, enough to uh, feed the average paranoid mind with uh, enough uh, material to send it right over the edge. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of backstabbing, but there was also quite a lot of good humoured comradeship, as you might say, and a lot and a lot of good humour actually. I mean, I remember travelling to gigs was um, was was quite often something to look forward to. I mean, there was you know there was there were usually it was done in good spirits. Coming back from gigs was not always such um, a high-spirited event. But most of the time, I looked forward to to doing tours. And, uh, you know, I can't say that I regret any of the time spent in that area at all. At this moment, I don't think that there's a likelihood that I'll ever perform with with uh, a band called Hawkwind again, unless it is a reforming of what I consider to be the best lineup of the band, which was in the days of uh, the Quark album, um, perhaps with a new bass player, or perhaps with Lemmy on bass, actually. To, 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 to re-establish for perhaps this one, a one-off gig, a sort of Hawkwind evening, including Lemmy, um, Turner, Brock, myself, maybe two or three people playing bass guitar. Um, never really was a sort of, uh, established bass player with the band for any length of time. The kind of music that interests me nowadays is, well, currently, I'm very much impressed by an American group called The Cars, and that's the sort of uh, I mean, highly professional rock music with feeling and technique and intelligence that I really fancy a lot. Um, I've recently been listening to the, uh, an album called Talk, Talk, Talk by the Psychedelic Furs, which I think is an interesting young band. 
I listen to classical music quite a lot, um, as I always have done from in 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 bouts from time to time. I get a sort of classical urge coming on, and I've got quite a lot of classical records in amongst my collection. Uh, I'm always interested in in what in what Bowie's doing next. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed his last album. Play it quite a lot. An album I have played quite a lot also is uh, Steve Swindle's solo album, which uh, is an excellent piece of work. Yeah, I um as I said earlier, I did um form a sort of uh music unit with these French blokes and did some gigs with them. I don't think we actually had a name apart from just me. It was just me plus uh them. Um but in the days in Margate I did play in a couple of local bands or sing with a couple of local bands but not in any way that um, made me think that I seriously wanted to do this for a living in fact I never really wanted to do it for a living at all I uh, only wanted to write I think uh, it was uh, a case of sort of delayed as adolescent you know a, a process that I had to get out of my system um, being in a rock band and so forth and so, I mean somewhere I remember reading somewhere that rock music was the literature of this generation which struck me as a very interesting remark because I was always much more interested in literary pursuits such as you know I really wanted to only write plays and poetry and not get involved in uh, music at all I have, that remark was something I had to think about for a while because in a way it is true I mean if you said that to the average professor of modern literature I think he'd probably deny uh, any truth in it although I have heard um, an academic broadcast on Radio 3 about the work of Chuck uh, about the work of Chuck Berry considered as an example of modern urban American poetry. But uh, if you think about it seriously, of course it is. I mean, I mean, rock is taken seriously as an expression of ideas and emotions and so on, which poetry is always done and literature is always done for generations. And this generation, my generation, and the current younger generation too, I think right across all the sort of British class barriers and right across the sort of all academic levels in colleges and so forth, I think that, you know, more people turn to uh, the work of rock-orientated writers like Bob Dylan for example, than they would do uh, to just, you know, literature on, on the page of a book. I mean, the, the album has replaced the book to a large extent. I think most, in if you, most times, not mine actually, I must admit, I mean, I've got actually far more books 
than uh, than records. But if you visit him, most most people's homes these days are, are, are you know are stocked in the reverse way. I mean, the you know there are far more records you'll find on shelves than than books. And uh, this is a process which is probably going to result in you know when video starts taking over from records, you know the book will probably have to establish itself as a you know a different status from what it's always held as a as a means of communication i mean even with poetry i mean poetry now modern poets are far more inclined to communicate with their audience through readings public readings than they are just through their books but the novel goes on and the theatre goes on and rock is actually at the moment or music the music business is going the same way of the novel you know I mean I mean it goes on there's in fact there's probably more bands now making records than there ever has been but there are fewer people buying the results than there ever has been and uh which is an extraordinary situation uh, in economic terms anyway but I think everything is just marking time now for a new home entertainment market which is certainly coming fast now I do not attempt to put any political social message in my lyrics at all I think it's uh one of the one of the great movie moguls, maybe it was one of the Warner Brothers. I'm not sure. Said, or was it Sam Goldwyn? I'm sure it was Sam Goldwyn. Said, if you want a message, then send for, you know, send a telegram. Um. If you want to get a message across, send a telegram. Send for Western Union, I think was the phrase he used. But I suppose uh, whatever you whatever you try to do isn't necessarily what you end up doing, or whatever you think you're not trying to do isn't what you end up actually doing if you make a statement in a song which is, which has more you know which is intended to carry more weight than simply a description of an unhappy love affair which is uh, what I've never written about um, if you if subject matter ranges wider than that then it's bound to have social content anyway um, unless you work in purely fantasy terms but I've never really done that to much of an extent what I've always done is I've used fantasy and science fiction elements to actually try to be relevant to to more everyday things. I mean, if you look at the poetry I've written, or that I've published so far, um, you'll probably notice that there's a lot more stuff there about everyday events than there is in the songs written so far. I've not really done, I've not really said anything, I've not really been overtly political in, in, in my work at all. Because I don't really think that, you know, I'm qualified to, 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 uh, you know, to be a political spokesman anyway. I don't know if anybody is anymore except a few highly 
trained and you know extremely intelligent specialists in the field of modern politics, sociology, and so forth, because what they're dealing with is something so complicated, something so extremely complex, more so than it's ever been in history before. So many interconnecting forces at work in modern politics. I mean, now that you know, there's so much intercommunication between you know, across the globe, uh, you have to be a specialist to understand it fully and to consider yourself uh, in any way qualified to make a sensible remark about it or when I'm not that, you know, I'm not a specialist in that at all. I see what I'm writing now as getting far more deeply involved with uh, concrete, detailed descriptions of things which can be applied to a wider area. That's the sort of writing I'm more interested in. You know, actually sort of focus on one small area with as much intensity as possible. Uh, the Cricket Star Flimsy disc was was just recorded by me and Adrian Wagner down at his home studio in Oxford. So it's really just me. Uh, a drummer in a band that was recording there at the time came in and just overdubbed the drums for us on it, but the rest of it was all was us too. Just on synths and vocals. Uh, the reason I included uh, so many past and present Orquin members on Lord of the Hornets is again for the same reasons as I said before. Uh, I can't really see myself going out, you know, sort of going through a sort of directory of uh, of uh, top flight session musicians, ringing them up and asking them, you know, people like Herbie Flowers or something like that, people like that, to come down to a studio and record with me. Um, I can't really see it happening uh, at all. I mean, I, what I mean is, I can't really see the result of such a uh, of such a, uh, a jamboree happening in in terms of the music itself. I mean, obviously, the musicians that I've worked with have been as much of an influence on the sort of music I write as I've been possibly on 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 the, on the way that they play. Um, so it's you know it's quite a natural thing to want to record with uh, you know people that you sort of more or less grown up with musically speaking, if indeed that's what's happened. Uh, no, I think I think if I went into the studio with with you know with a bunch of musicians who I, that I've never worked with before that I've selected on their reputations as musicians, the result would probably be totally synthetic. But in any case, I mean, with the people on 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 Lord of the Hornets, uh, it just it just sort of mates uh, what that one you know one finds it. Charlie, that's that's uh, that's my dog going bonkers because it's dawn, and there are people walking past the window. It'll be quiet in a minute. Charlie, go quiet, please. Thank you.
yeah, I've got uh, I've got a single release planned for September, which is a song from the from the new, new album, and it's called "We Like to Be Frightened." I have indeed, over the past few months, performed several one-man shows in London, and what the material that I've included in them was a sort of review of, I mean, a lot of it was uh, dramati dramatised bits from Captain Lockheed, which, uh, by the way, has been performed by colleges and schools throughout the world actually over the years I've, I've often had letters asking my permission from school from or from the head of a school drama department or something like that from America mostly America and and areas in England I've never actually been able to see one of these productions or, or, or even really had any news about how how they turned out but you know a number of them have been done as far as I know and uh, these sort of actually these were one man these shows in London at the Theatre Space and there was uh, there was Five Nights at the Arts Theatre as well these weren't actually one man shows they were uh, they, they they included uh, two other people Jill Riches and Pete Pavley and a couple of uh, backline people operating the uh, Sounds and lights, and they were actually uh, reviews of, of past material and present material. A couple of Hawkwind numbers in there, like Quark, Strangers and Charm, the actual the song itself, using backing tapes and live vocals mostly, and quite a lot of uh, stand-up comedy, really, I suppose. I mean, uh, I just, you know, I found that in the first the first evening, that I found that my sort of chat between items in the show seemed to develop into sort of spontaneous comic routine, which I sort of expanded more. And now I incorporate in the show, which I do intend to take elsewhere, for sure. I'd like to do a full-scale tour of the country with the show. And I'm certainly going to be doing three weeks in, at the Edinburgh Festival this year. Uh, I, I, that would be, in fact, most to an audience, mostly composed of sort of Edinburgh fringe theatre goers, which should be quite interesting. I'd, I'd be very interested to see how my material goes down with a sort of, with a completely new audience and not just relying on what cult following I've got to fill a place with, uh, which is a very easy way of um, getting away with almost anything. If you uh, if you're that sort of person, I mean, I, I always try and put as much as I can into what I'm doing. But I'd be interested to see how it how it how it does go down with uh, people who are not familiar with the material or the sort of the legend, as it were. I've had thoughts of getting a, a band together, but not a full time band. I can't. I, the the main reason why I had to leave Hawkwind was that I can't really work properly in the uh, the setup of a full-time band. It is what it implies. It is full-time, and I'm, my way of working demands that I have enough free time to, to branch off in all the directions I I feel the need to branch off into. I have written a book called Hype, about the music business, and it isn't based on my own experiences as such. It is... A lot of it is derived from, uh, obviously, from um, 
stuff I've picked up from hanging around record companies a lot. Um, I've drawn characters who are recognizable types, but not individuals from these experiences. But the actual, the, the, the storyline of the book and the events in it are not based on my own experiences, but are fiction. It's going to be published by New English Library in September. And there is an album included, which is, how can I describe this best? It, the, the, the novel and the album complement each other in this way that the, the, the book describes what happens to a young band who get very badly used by a record company in a, an internal power struggle between two sort of over ambitious individuals who use this band as a sort of pawn or counter in a sort of elaborate game of uh, spy versus spy almost, but it's not a comedy actually. I wanted I wanted it to be a comedy. I want I, I when I I had initial talks with New English Library about doing the book. I, uh, I had in, very much in mind the sort of doing it as a, uh, almost like a sort of, you know, the way that P.G. Woodhouse would, would might have written about the music business had he, had he known about it, you know, in the way that he wrote about Hollywood in the 20s. I wanted to write about the music business in, in, the, in the 80s or at least the late 70s. But they sort of talked me around to the way of seeing the potential of writing a thriller about the business, which um, I ended up doing, but it has got sort of elements of black humour, you know, sort of sarcasm and humour in it. Although the plot is very much a sort of uh, fast-moving thriller-type plot, the album is the songs of the band themselves, who are called the Tom Mahler Band. Mahler, as in the composer, M A H L E R, and. That's going to be released at the same time as the book. Ah, my plans for the future. Well, after Edinburgh, which will bring me up to September, and the book's release, the next thing I want to do is an album based on one of the shows I did in London, which is called The Kid from Silicon Gulch, which is a detective story for the cybernetic age, if you like. There's an album there. I also very much want to do an album for children. Uh, I've got a lot of material. I think this will probably be in the form of music and spoken word and some songs. But I've got a, a story which I've actually do as a book as well for children. I have it very much in mind. I'd, 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 I'm interested to see how well the novel works out as a, as an, you know, as a saleable commodity. Because I'd like to do more novels. I've got a few planned I'd like to do, but I haven't really got very far into doing them yet. But uh, if I can buy myself the time to concentrate on a on a a protracted work. I'd like to do that. I'd like to write a really healthy, strong book. And not you know, I mean I don't see myself substituting that for music. But I've always seen music as something to integrate into other 
media. Um, I've never studied music seriously at all, but I seem to have the knack of being able to write a, a song. And not everybody has that knack. And I suppose I should keep on using it to, um, you know, not, so, you know, it's a trade in a way. But then, you know, writing is also a, tr a much more demanding trade. And I'd like to be able to devote more time to it and less time to, um, the demanding you know, the demands of the music business, which um, which is the reason why I don't want to work with a full-time band. I'm very interested indeed in in writing plays, and I've done a couple of them uh, in a small way. I'd like to write a play that is produced properly and possibly for television, but the stage is—I mean, the stage is something that I've always really seen as my media, and working with music because it's, it's just you know I was always more interested in, in what you could do on the stage than what you could do in in, in the studio. And that's what I probably will combine more with music is uh, is 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 drama. So uh, I haven't got any plans for retiring yet, by any means at all. But I think I ought to go to bed now, actually, for a while. It's, it's very sort of late. Oh, it's, it's daylight and the birds are singing. So I hope this is enough. For, I'm sure this is more than enough material. I hope it's, got, it's not too difficult for you to sort it all out.